Good evening. I am Deb Lubis, GFWC Florida Communications and PR Chairman, and we welcome you all to tonight's webinar. And uh, in the webinar is on teen dating, violence, and human trafficking. Our presenters tonight are Lee Krause, GFWC Florida Domestic Violence <coughs> Chairman, and Tamika Thomas Simpson, GFWC Florida Human Trafficking Chairman. Our chairman will introduce their special guest shortly tonight, shortly in a couple minutes. We are also want to acknowledge and thank GFWC Florida Second Vice President Laura Conley and GFWC Florida <laughs> Comps and PR technology guru Carolyn Windham for their support during tonight's webinar. Our communications PR and technology <laughs> membership and leadership committees are bringing you this year's webinar series and take turns as hosts or hostesses. <laughs> Let's start with some quick Zoom instructions. So your mic is now muted and video is off and is off during the speaker's presentations. We have multiple parts in the presentation today and tonight permitting, we will open up the floor for questions at the end of each of the section of the, each presentation. You can type your questions in the Zoom <clears throat> chat box. The chat box is also how you should communicate any technology issues and we will respond to you in that fashion in the chat box. It is now my pleasure to present Lee Krause, your GFWC Florida Domestic Violence Chairman. Good evening, and I am really happy that all of you chose to come tonight to join us. And for the ones that can't come tonight, you'll be logging on at another time for the uh, recorded webinar. At the fall convention, some of you heard my workshop on domestic violence. At that time, I stated that there were other focus areas in the signature program, but I wouldn't have time to talk about each of them because we were limited in time. Well, Tonight's a new, new area, and it is on teen dating violence. So what exactly is teen dating violence? Or it's also called TDV. Well, it is an adverse childhood experience that affects millions of young people in the United States. Dating violence can take place in person, online, or through technology. It's really a type of intimate partner violence that can include the following types of behavior. I want to go back to that intimate partner violence that I just spoke about. The ones of you that took the domestic violence heard that those phrases, intimate partner violence, very, very common in domestic situations, even teen dating violence. So what types of behavior are included in this? First of all, there's physical violence, and that's when a person is gonna hurt or tries to hurt a partner or a date by hitting, kicking, or using another type of physical force. They can pinch. You know, there's all kinds of things they can do. They can pull your hair, they can on and on and on. The second one is sexual violence. And that is forcing or attempting to force a partner to take part in a sex act and or sexual touching when the partner doesn't want to do it. They don't want to consent to this. They want to refuse. Probably uh, teen dating drugs, you've heard of that, where, where they, they don't know what they're doing. So they certainly can consent and they can't refuse. It also includes non-physical sexual behaviors like posting or sharing sexual pictures of a partner without their consent or sexting someone without their consent. Another area is psychological aggression. This is very, very bad. It is the use of verbal and nonverbal communication with the intent to harm a partner. Lastly, stalking. Well, this is a pattern of repeated unwanted attention and contact 
by a current or former partner that causes fear or safety concern for an individual victim or someone close to the victim. Now, can you imagine how you would feel if you knew your teenage daughter, granddaughter, niece was being stalked? I mean, it would be terrible, but it happens all the time. Teen dating violence profoundly, profoundly impacts lifelong health, opportunity, and well-being. You know, unhealthy relationships can start really early in life, and they can last a lifetime. So I have a poll for you, and here's the poll. And Laura, I, do you want to tell them how they're going to take this poll? Yes, you all should hopefully see a poll question on your screen. I want you to go ahead and click your answer. And I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to respond. And then Leah's going to, I'll share the responses. And uh, Leah's going to walk through that with us. Okay. So I can see you guys all popping in there doing your responses. Good job. We've got just about everybody. Give you another few seconds, those of you who haven't answered yet. I'm very interested to see how this turns out. Okay, we've got <clears throat> just about everybody. Last call if you want to weigh in. And I will close the poll. And there you go, Lee. You should be able to see the results, right? Yep. So the truth, 98% uh, said yes, and 2% said no. And actually, it was definitely true. Okay, Laura, you need to make yourself smaller because you're covering my script. Now you've got the slides and I don't have my script. Okay. So you want to minimize the zoom, the little okay. green arrow, and you should be able to see your script again or use your printed copy. I have a copy. There you go. Sorry, guys. Give me a second and I will be right back with you. Okay. So let's talk about how big that problem is. Actually, 1.5 million high school students experience physical abuse yearly. That's roughly about one in 12 US students experience not only physical dating violence, but sexual dating violence. So pretend you're looking at a classroom where there are 24 students, two or more, are involved in teen dating violence. You know, sometimes teens think, often think, that behaviors like teasing and name calling are part of a relationship. But you know, you know they're not. They don't know that they're not. They, they just think, well, maybe this is okay, especially if they are living in some type of an environment where there is domestic violence in their home because then they see that action. And so they think that it's all right if it's going on and they're dating with someone else. However, we all know that those behaviors can become abusive and develop into serious forms of violence. So some teens are at greater risk than others. Female students experienced higher rates of physical and sexual dating violence than male. And if the teen was part of an LGBTQ community, they experienced even higher levels of abuse. In teen dating violent, violence re relationships, there are three important roles. And now, Laura, if you'll put up poll number two. I will. Let me just get there one moment. There, you should be able to see it. Do you see it, Lee? Yep. Okay, great. So ladies, go ahead and give us your response. We'll give you about another 30 seconds on this one. All right, we're going to have you finish up. We've got most of you have responded. Last call. And we will close it. 
and share the results. There you go, Lee. Wow. Oh my gosh, you girl, you girls should buy lotto tickets or something. You're doing great. <clears throat> yes, you will find out later that truthfully, um, some teens who experience this do indeed marry the abuser. Yep, absolutely. So there's several roles in the teen dating violence. And I want to talk about what those roles are. So the first one is the abuser. Well, you can pretty much figure out what happens with this person. This is the person who physically, sexually, and verbally or emotionally hurts a dating partner. The abusive partner uses this pattern of violent and coercive behavior to gain power and maintain that control over the dating partner. In fact, sometimes the victim as I just said to you, they indeed marry her or his teen dating abuser. So you have the next one. And you know what? Well, you can just about write your own definition of what the victim is. This is a person who is hurt physically, sexually, verbally, or emotionally by a dating partner. But the last one's pretty interesting. I thought this was um, interesting when I started to research this a little bit. What about this bystander role? Well, it's a person who's aware that someone is being abused in a dating relationship. The bystander may become aware of the abuse through the abusers or targets, action or words, or through secondhand information. So they don't really see the fact that this victim is being abused, but someone comes to them and tells them what's going on. So the question is, what can you do about teen dating violence? Well, before we're going to answer that question, I want you to be able to recognize TVD when you see it. There are consequences which are exhibited with someone that is experiencing this particular type of assault. So let's look at how, how they look and what's going on in their life. Well, they're probably gonna be depressed. Uh, they're gonna show anxiety symptoms. They're going to engage in unhealthy behavior. Uh, you know, a lot of kids smoke, so I'm not sure if that's gonna be a telltale sign, but using drugs and alcohol, that could probably be a tell for you. They're going to exhibit a lot of anti-social behaviors like lying and theft and bullying and hitting. And they're going to think about suicide. So you ask yourself, well, how do I know they're thinking about suicide? That's a tough one. Unless, unless they have friends that they are going to tell or unless you see something when they have a computer up and they're looking at stuff and they're looking about how they can actually commit suicide. To sh I mean, maybe that's a way you can see if they're thinking about it. But those are actions that are exhibited by teens that are experiencing teen dating violence. So the next question is, what can you do about it? What, what do you think you can do about this? Well, I'm going to give you a list of items. You're going to listen to what the student or family is saying, or the friend of the family is saying, and try to do this the best you can without interruption. You know, we always think of the answer that we want to give while someone is talking to us. That's not what you should do here. You need to listen to what they're saying. Find out what the person would really like to do about the relationship and then support them regardless of their decision. You may let them know that abuse usually gets worse. They're gonna probably think it's not gonna get any worse than this. It's just like the woman in a domestic violence home, the wife or the husband, mainly wives, unfortunately, and they think that it's gonna get better, he's gonna stop, et cetera, et cetera. But that, does, that is not what happens. The abuse gets worse over time. Next thing is you need to let them know that you're going to be there if they need you. If they ever, ever need you, you'll be there. 
you almost need to expect that the person is going to be confused about their feelings and about what to do. And guess what? They're going to change their mind, maybe even a few times. They may say they're going to do this one week, and then the next week they've changed the whole complexion of their thinking. Don't get discouraged with that. Watch your body language and respect the person's right to privacy and personal space. Decide how you should proceed with informing any other persons, especially if you feel that person's safety may be in danger. Let's say you know, you've seen, you've seen this. The bystander has seen that teen being assaulted. Well, you know, when you know that the person's safety is in danger, you have to decide how you're going to proceed about that. And by all means, help the person become informed of available resources. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of um, websites in just a minute that you can go to, that you can take back to your club. These are great websites, and I think they'll help you in that way. Um, so I want to talk about another, a little bit more about how we can prevent teen dating violence. You need to teach safe and healthy relationship skills. If they're in a domestic family life where they're seeing unhealthy relationships, how are they gonna learn about healthy ones? Well, that's where engaging influential adults and peers are, it's so helpful to have that mentor there to help, help that child. And you need to disrupt this de developmental pathway toward partner violence. I mean, you heard me talk about this in the um, workshop that I had in September. This is crucial. You have to be able to disrupt that pathway. And then you have to help create protective environments. Um, we have juniorette clubs. We happen to have one in Naples. There's not that many around. It would be great if you could start junior at clubs in your club because that's one way to teach what we're talking about right here. You can teach these junior at safe and healthy relationship skills. You can go right down the list and go, that's a wonderful way to work with these young people. Um, strength and economic supports for families and su support survivors to increase safety and lessen harm to them. Okay, so now I talked to you about, um, oh, and one more thing. Now, the slides that we're going to show next is, this is, this is how you need to think as parents, grandparents, aunts, sisters, friends, whatever. Here's a wonderful, wonderful um, site that you can go on to and get this wonderful safety card. It's a teen safety card and it's called hanging out or hooking up. So this is futureswithoutviolence.org. And what this does is it challenges teens and young adults to reflect on how the person they are seeing is treating them, not how they think they're treating them, but how they're really treating them. It identifies dynamics of a healthy relationship and prompts teens to consider signs that may indicate abuse that maybe they weren't thinking about before. This is a card you can hand out. This tool explores how to confront excessive text messaging. And that, you know, kid, teens are on their phones all the time. And you never know whether that message they're getting is healthy or unhealthy. This is going to give them a tool to explore how to confront that if it's not healthy. Also, it examines the difference between consensual versus pressured sex. There's a difference. Now, you would think that our teenagers would be able to tell this, this fact, wouldn't you? I don't, I'm not so sure. You know, they can hardly decide what they're going to wear one day to the next, and you think they are going to be able to tell whether what they're experiencing is something that they want or whether it is being pressured on them. So I think that we as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, 
we need to be on the lookout for this. So this card provides tips to those seeking ways to support that young person. Second, the second um, website is loveisrespect.org. Now this site is for you to use to see information of healthy versus unhealthy relationships again. And it's a project of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. I called this, as a matter of fact, just to see what it was all about. And it was excellent. They got right on and they said, can we help you? Are you in trouble? What can we do for you? And I explained what was going on. And they were happy to see that you know, we were going to be talking about this tonight. So this is a project of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Love is Respect offers 24-7 information, support, and advocacy to young people, people between the ages of 12 to 26 who have questions or concerns about their romantic relationships. They provide total support to concerned family members. So I'm going to tell you a real quick little personal story. I had a friend of mine that we went to dinner with the other night. She got a phone call and she's in her 40, I guess she's 49. She has a daughter who is 21 and she excused herself from the table. She came back and she said, I'm really sorry, but my daughter just is having a hard time with her boyfriend. And he's, you know, he's just saying some nasty things and he doesn't want her to go back to her apartment. And he, you know, he wants her to do this and he wants her to do that and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know what? That really sounds like possibly this is domestic violence. I, and she's a 21 year old. So you wouldn't think of her as a teenager, but look at this. They're saying from, from 12 to 26. So even young adults are having issues like this. So this is a perfect spot for them to call and see what to do. Lastly, I would like to reiterate one more time what you are not supposed to do. Be careful to not judge the person, A. B, give advice. Instead, talk to them about the choices they have and help them find persons able to help. The other thing not to do is ask unnecessary questions. You know, this victim may shut down if they feel like they're being pressed to share information that they do not want to share, they may just stop. They may stop talking. And that's that. And you really don't want that to happen. You want that open communication, that line of them feeling comfortable to come to you because you never know when they're really going to need you to need you. And then the last is don't over don't overreact. You know, no matter what they say, try not to overreact because, again, they have to feel like they are coming to you and you are their confidant. You're going to make them feel comfortable. You're going to, if you can't help them, you're going to guide them to someone who can help them. And that's the best you can do. I mean, right there. So I'm hoping that you'll get the teen dating card. I think that's wonderful that you'll go on site, look up love is respect. There are valuable, valuable tools there for you. And by all means, take them back to your club. Um, if you want to give me a call, I'm sending out a note to all the district directors uh, with my personal cell phone number. And certainly if you have any questions, by all means, call me and I'll, anything I could do to help you. But right now, I am very thrilled to welcome Dana Rutherford, who is with the Spring of Tampa Bay. I'm going to give you a little bio about her. Dana experienced years of domestic violence and childhood crisis. After surviving and healing from these experiences, Dana began to advocate for trauma survivors by speaking at churches, um, local events, and through social media, while she now works for a certified domestic violence organization, the Spring of Tampa Bay. In 2022, she accomplished the lifelong dream, her lifelong dream, of becoming a Florida Gator. 
and walking the stage in a cap and gown for the very first time, graduating with her Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology and honors from the University of Florida at 36 years old. Way to go, Dana, very proud of you. She also remarried and ministers with her husband, Tim, and their three children and two stepchildren. So Dana shares her story in hopes tonight of inspiring trauma survivors like herself. Dana, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Thank you. So as Lee said, my name is Dana Rutherford. I am the events and communications manager at the Spring of Tampa Bay. And with the spring, we do many things with survivors, which I'll cover a little bit later. But as was stated before, abuse is a very, it's a very layered thing where it's not only physical. The physical stuff is horrible and it causes a lot of damage mentally and emotionally. But the impact of all types of abuse can really harm someone anywhere from spiritual, financial, emotional, and the list goes on. In fact, uh, statistically, it's the most dangerous time for a survivor is when they leave because that's when it gets the heat gets turned up. So even with teen dating violence, we will see that many teens, um, even when they try to leave, that's when things get really hard for them. Either the person harasses or stalks, maybe they send photos to their friends, whatever they can do to try to trap the victim. And how do I know all this? Because like Lee stated, I am a survivor. So I grew up as the middle child. They get, you know, a lot of bad raps at times, but I was the, I am the middle child of a cham a family of five and I was a daddy's girl, but I couldn't see that the toxic marriage between my mom and dad would set the tone for some of the things that I believed as a child. So my parents were very good people. They were very kind people, but because of the opiate addictions back in the eighties and nineties, they were told that prescription drugs were not as addictive as they were. They became addicted to prescription drugs and it caused a lot of instability in my home and uh, having two addicts as parents caused a lot of fighting and a lot of codependency between the two of them. And it started to give me some narratives of what I thought love was love was loyal when it didn't deserve to be love was didn't matter if the person hurt you you stayed and you because they never divorced so I figured okay you stay and um, being raised Christian as well as I am still today um, I believe that divorce just was not an option and um, that we had to just stick it out even when it was not what God ever intended it to be so um, they neglected us, unfortunately. And when I was a teenager, I started to obviously, you know, you're, you're getting that feeling where you want to become an adult, but I was dealing with a lot of depression, uh, a lot of suicidal thoughts. And um, I just wanted to feel loved. I just wanted someone to give me attention. And I just wanted to feel like I mattered to somebody. So um, I, when I was about 15 years old, I went to church camp <laughs> And I, um, it was my first time and I was super excited and I met a boy there and he was, you know, around my age and, you know, it was church camp. So I was like, okay, you know, the people here, they're all like me. They all, you know, or have the faith I do and they all do what they do. And I just honestly thought, well, you know, if I meet him at church camp, there's no way that there's not anything wrong with this person. And, um, because he showed me all this attention and, and everything I wanted, I, um, I just literally just took it all. And, you know, there were some red flags back then that I ignored. Um, I mean, he had a really bad temper and, but he didn't hit me. So if he broke something, I thought, okay, that's just his temper. And he was a foster child. So I thought, okay, well, he's a foster child. I have to help him. I have to fix him. I have to be there for him. Even though I was going through a, hor a horrible childhood myself, I kept thinking to myself that his was worse than mine. So I needed to be there for him. And I ended up getting my GED at 16 years old. I ended up dropping out of high school because we were so, we were moving around so much. There was so much instability 
and my family and school was the one thing I had going for me. And I was really good at it. And I had dreams of going to college. I was going to go to the university of Florida and I was going to make something of myself. And when I had to drop out, it just further messed my self-esteem up. So I ended up wanting to get out of my home so bad that I uh, decided to get married at 18 years old, which was not the best decision, but um, I was barely a woman and I was getting married right around the time I got married, two and a half months after I got married, my mother went to the hospital which was common for them. They, they often would get prescription drugs at the hospital, but um, they informed me that her liver was failing. And six days later, my mom died at 44 years old. Um, three weeks, three weeks after my mom died, my dad died from um, prescription drugs as well. So I was 18 years old and lost both my parents within three weeks right after being married. So it just created a trauma bond with my then 19 year old husband. So we were teenagers, but we were married and we were, I was just in a horrible, horrible place, but he was there and I, it further made me think, okay, well, you know, he's the one I have left and I need to keep this relationship. My little brother who was 24 at the time also passed away from prescription drugs. Um, so it was a lot of death early on. So as a younger person, I just wanted someone to be there, someone that wouldn't die, someone that wouldn't go away. But in reality, he was, he was started to cheat on me. He started to do things that were leaving me, but I was so desperate to keep this relationship because that's what you do when you're married, as I was shown. And I just needed someone to be there. Well, it got progressively worse as Lee stated uh the the 16 year old boy that I met at church camp was not the man that would grow into the 30s with me um, we did have three children we had we have three boys all you know of all it's three boys so um you know I always thought to myself like I don't ever want them to think that this is how you treat a woman but I was just thinking it was doing the right thing for them by staying with their dad for a long time. And he would gaslight me. He would manipulate me. He would lie to me and then make me feel bad for not trusting him, even though he was lying to me. And it just became such a, you know, there were good times. There was a lot of good times because with abuse, a lot of times people think, oh, you must have been miserable all the time. No, it was actually a really we had some really great memories because the cycle of abuse they give you all the love you want and after they abuse you so it's sickly addicting even to teenagers when they know that love bombing's coming they know that that cycle that honeymoon stage is coming so a lot of abusers use that time to further you know keep the person there well, it eventually escalated as we got into our thirties and, um, he began to become more physically abusive. So he would first break things. And like I said before, and hold me down or push me at times when we were, when we were younger, but I still didn't see that as physical. And even when he began to kind of shove me or grab me hard, I still couldn't see it was physical, but all of that is physical abuse but he started to hit me, kick me, spit on me and do lots of things that were just horrible. And my kids, he never hurt them, but they saw and heard things at a very young age. And um, he would break sentimental items in mine. My mom who passed away, like I said before, gave me a jewelry box. He broke it, things like that to just hurt me and um, would I started to want to get a job and from being a stay at home mom and, you know, he started to sabotage things like that. So the financial abuse was very rough. And, you know, one day I just sat there and I remember thinking, you know, this isn't what love should be. And what really, really made me start to think about getting out was the fear of either my children being taken by CPS because I am not keeping them safe because neighbors were calling the cops and I would always take up for him, but I knew there could be a day that they say that I was not keeping them safe or them losing me to death if he killed me. 
So I decided that my children had to come first in this. And even before myself, which was funny because for so long I was putting my kids first, what I thought by staying with their dad, but reality it was they needed to see me be strong. And um, I needed to break this codependency that I became an addict of myself. I became an addict through being a codependent, which was a very difficult thing to break. It's extremely difficult to break that bond of abuse, but also codependency. But I decided to do it. I decided that I needed to get out. And that's what I did. Unfortunately, when I called all the shelters, they were all full and there wasn't a whole lot I could do at that time. And I don't have a lot of family. So I had to, I, me and my boys were bouncing around um, homeless for 100, 114 days, we counted. And um, between hotels and friends' couches and anything that we could find. But finally, I was able to, um, people blessed me with money and I was very smart with my money. And I was able to find a little trailer in Lutz where um, I was able to purchase it. It was very small, very gross, <laughs> not fun, but it was my own. And it was the first thing I ever had that was my own. And so um, it was one of the darkest moments of being told no with the shelters. I was like, wow, man, I may never get out, but it ended up being the driving force of why I do what I do today and fundraising for survivors of domestic violence. And so um, once I started to heal and get back on my feet, um, I was thinking like, wow, I really need to show my boys like what a strong woman is so that they do not turn into abusers themselves or become abused because the cycle of abuse often um, can repeat itself in children if it's not, you know, healed and taken care of. And um, so I knew that I needed to get a job and do something with my life, but I just didn't have a whole lot of experience. So I had some college credits I had taken um, back when I was in my early 20s. So I decided, you know, I'll just get my associate's degree at the Hillsborough County or Hillsborough Community College in Tampa. But um, as I kept going, I'm like, you know, I really want to get my bachelor's. And I found out that uh, the University of Florida, where it was my dream school that I always wanted to go to, had an online program. So I, um, I, I, sorry, the word I'm trying to think, I, I signed up to see if I could get accepted into the University of Florida. Sorry, it's been a long day. So <laughs> um, they accepted me into the bachelor's program. And so um, I was accepted into the bachelor's program and I ended up at 36 years old because I got my GED. I never got to wear a cap and gown and I never got to do a graduation. So this was my first time ever walking a stage. I was probably one of the oldest people there <laughs> and I was crying as I walked. And these kids probably thought like, what is wrong with this lady? But they didn't realize, you know, how much it meant to me to walk that stage. And, and my kids got to see that too. And they told me they were proud of me and that meant more to me than anything. So um, as I got my degree, I started working with um, a couple of organizations, but I ended up at the spring of Tampa Bay. And that is where I am now. I also remarried as uh, Lee stated, and um, my husband is former law enforcement and is now working as well with domestic violence and trauma. And um, we are doing things together, but also um, I work for the spring, which is separate from that. And uh, I have two stepkids with his children and I have the three boys. So now we are like the Brady Bunch and we <laughs> have five between us. So I have mine hundred percent of the time. Their father just recently signed his rights away. And um, which actually is a great thing because my husband now is, is going to adopt them. We have the paperwork in hand. So um, we're, we're going through the courts now and we're just waiting for that court date for them to be officially name change to my husband's name and um, to change this, to break this cycle, not only in their lives, but to break it by even changing their name. So they will no longer even have that bloodline. So um, it's just a full restoration. And um, I now get to work for the spring. And I say all this not to brag on myself or say, you know, anything that is to try to make myself seem like you know, because if, if I can make it through abuse, anybody can, anybody can, because I had so many odds against me. And um, I say all this because 
you know, as teenagers, it's easy to think of them as puppy love. I have now my oldest son is 14. So, um, and he, there's a girl he's in a, I guess a relationship with, I don't know what you call it at 14, but a girl he likes. And, you know, I think of that time in my life, I was 15 when I met his dad. So it's very easy sometimes to look at teenagers and think, oh, you know, what do they know? It's just puppy love. It's not going to last. It's not going to be anything like that. But if you see the signs of abuse, even in a teenager, not only can it uh, affect their relationships later on, if they do break up and then they go on to the next relationship, it takes a piece of you each time. So you, so learning those traits now to try to help that teenager before they continue this cycle is important, but also they can end up marrying them like I did. And before you know it, that 19 year old boy, that 18 year old boy, 15 year old boy can become a grown man that may become more and more abusive. Um, but with the spring of Tampa Bay, it's a great thing that I now get to fundraise and do events and um, communications and marketing for the for the center itself. Um, the spring of Tampa Bay is Hillsborough County um, only certified domestic violence prevention and emergency shelter in Hillsborough or in Hillsborough County area. So that's mostly Tampa that people think about, but it, Hillsborough County has more than just Tampa in it. And uh, for 45 years, the spring of Tampa Bay's sole reason for existence has been to provide safety, shelter, and supportive services to survivors of domestic violence and their children. And um, we have numerous programs. A lot of people think, oh, you guys are that shelter or you're that crisis hotline, which we are, but we also have many, many programs that go from the shelter to our uh, kids team. We have a full public school on site. So if uh, survivors are needing their children to be in a confidential school, we have that there for them. We have a pet program because there are many people that will not leave abuse because they love their pet. And some people may find that silly, but if you love your pet, you may understand. And so we have an, a little place for their pet. Um, we also have our economic empowerment, which helps women get on their feet to get that job and to get in the workforce. Um, housing, we have apartments that are um, for women to get into for a year and so on and so on, including the things that are listed on the screen. I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, it, again, domestic violence, teen dating violence, it's all about power and control. And it's all about putting fear into the victim, into the survivor. And so there are ways to stop this. If you know someone that is going through this, no matter what the age, um, if they're in Hillsborough County, they can call us at the spring and we will help get them the resources that they need. Even if it is a teen diet, teen dating violence situation, we will help to try to get every resource we can. Um, but it, whatever your county is, if it's teen dating or if it's abuse, no matter how old, young, whatever socioeconomic class, any race, any gender, just call your local hotline and um, get the help you need because as we've seen a lot of times, it can sometimes wait until it's too late and um, we don't want that. So I hope that my story today shows that there is life after abuse. Um, if you have experienced abuse, you can have life after, but it's important to get out and to, um, to, to get out of the situation itself. Wow, Dana, I can't, I mean, honestly, that was, I, it's a terrible story to have to listen to, except it had such a happy ending. <laughs> it was, it's just wonderful. And I can't thank you enough for sharing that story with us. You know, when you listen to you and you really hear a survivor, it makes what we're doing become even more prevalent and important to us. Um, I'd like to also thank you for staying on for the remainder of the webinar and for being part of our breakout rooms. Next up, I'd like to, um, you, you know Tamika Simpson, uh, Tamika Thompson Simpson, and she is our GFWC Florida Human Trafficking Chairperson. Tamika? All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here tonight for such a heavy conversation, but one that is necessary. Lee and I, along with GFWC and GFWC Florida, are dedicated to having these conversations in order to bring about change. 
I shared information um, with many of you at fall board, at which time I gave very surface level information as to what human trafficking looks like um, and what we can do to end it. I made a promise that there would be other opportunities to dive a bit deeper into how we work to end this horrific crime. Slavery in plain sight. So slavery in plain sight is what human trafficking is often referred to. This evening, I will provide a refresher for those of you who are familiar. Define human trafficking for those who are not as familiar, so don't worry. Dive into ways that we can continue to fight and then look at what is our work and our steps individually and as an organization. So our refresher, what is human trafficking? There should be a poll that comes up with a statement. I need you to answer if it, you think it's myth or fact. All right, one moment and I will pop that poll up for you ladies. There you go, can you see it, Tamika? Yes, I can. <clears throat> Wonderful. Go ahead, ladies, you can answer. We'll give you about 60 seconds to put your response in. All right, looks like just about everybody has weighed in. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And there you go, Tamika, can you see the results now? I can see them. Okay. Oh, like about 87% said myth, okay. 87% myth, got it. Okay, so let's see. So your question, this, the answer to the question is myth. So the majority of you were correct in that, but that's okay. While some traffickers physically hold the people they exploit, it is more common for them to use psychological means of control, fear, trauma, drug addiction, threats against families, and lack of options due to poverty and homelessness can all prevent someone from leaving. Some individuals who experience trafficking may also be manipulated or believe they are in love with the trafficker, which can make them resistant to seeking help. Isolation, holding identification, shame, debt bondage, controlling money. Human trafficking is the buying, selling, and trading of human beings for labor and or sex acts by force, fraud, or coercion. Force is only one, of, one way of keeping a victim in bondage. Fraud or lying and coercion, trafficker holds important documents as collateral over their victims. When most hear the words human trafficking, they immediately think of sex trafficking. But there is domestic servitude and forced labor that are just as heinous. So who does human trafficking impact? Anyone can be impacted by human trafficking, whether directly or indirectly. Human trafficking does not discriminate. It has no exclusions for age, socioeconomic class, race, ethnicity, or gender. Although there are some categories such as sex trafficking that disproportionately impact women and girls. Who are the traffickers? Again, the answer is anyone. Traffickers could be family members, friends, significant others, or strangers. All right, there's another poll that's gonna come up for you. Well, maybe it's going to come up. <laughs> it's not wanting to let me launch it. Sorry, Tamika. I don't know why. Let me try one more time. Okay, no worries. It's very bizarre. Okay, we're just going to have to walk through without poll number four. So sorry. All right, that's okay. So poll number four, the question was um, another truth or fault, a truth or myth, and it was trafficking involves some sort of transportation or travel across borders. And the answer to that is false. So where does human trafficking occur? Can you guess? Human trafficking can happen to anyone, by anyone, anywhere, in our country, in our state, 
city, neighborhood, right next door. So how do we continue the fight? We are very pleased to have with us this evening, Rachel Neese with Hope for Justice. Rachel insisted on dropping the formalities of an introduction in order to get right into the information sharing. She will tell you about Hope for Justice, our GFWC relationship with Hope for Justice and some options for fighting to eradicate this crime so that we have what human trafficking looks like in order for us to help others who may be victims and also help ourselves not become victims. Rachel. Thank you so much, Tamika. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. Um, Hope for Justice is the newest affiliate of GFWC as of last year. Um, and it's just been a real pleasure getting to know everyone and be, having these opportunities to share about Hope for Justice um, and how we're uh, in the fight to uh, end human trafficking altogether. Um, I do have a video, it's pretty short, but it just gives an overview of what Hope for Justice does, um, just to kind of set the stage, if that would be okay. You bet. Let me just get where we need to be one moment. Sorry about that. Get out of my PowerPoint and into your video. Well, no, not yet. One moment, ladies, we will get there. I appreciate all that you're doing, Laura, handling all of the uh, behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> well, some days it goes a little more smoothly than other days, but we're gonna we're gonna get there. So here, I think we've got it now. And no, there we go. Oops, you know what? I think I forgot to share the sound. All right. Last time, I promise it's gonna go this time. There's a little box you have to check that says share sound. And now. Slavery, a term that conjures images of some of the darkest practices in human history, stripping a human being of their freedom and their dignity in the name of greed and profit. People don't feel that slavery actually still exists. Um, however, uh, we know differently that people are being forced to do unspeakable acts for profit. It's plain to see that slavery hasn't ended, it's just evolved into something completely different. Right now, it's estimated that there are over 40 million victims of modern day slavery. One in every four victims are children. Whether it's domestic servitude, forced labor, or sexual exploitation, traffickers treat people like commodities and transport them all over the world to be used or to be sold for profit. It's clear that slavery affects the lives of millions across the world. So in 2008, a team of people founded Hope for Justice to do just that. Hope for Justice has built a professional and transformational response to the issue of modern day slavery. Wherever slavery exists, Hope for Justice is committed to ending it once and for all. Specialist teams identify victims of sex trafficking, forced labor, and domestic servitude through investigative and community outreach work. We work alongside the police and other agencies to build bridges of trust that help people find their freedom and get them the support they need. We stand alongside survivors of human trafficking as they walk the path to freedom and independence. The final stage to abolishing slavery for good in our world depends on the world around us. Reforming society to actively fight against those who wish to exploit others and protect those who are vulnerable to traffickers. We are meeting with government entities all around the world to help nations improve their legislation surrounding modern slavery and exploitation. As for the rest of society, Hope for Justice continues to raise awareness and train people to spot the signs of modern slavery. With all these proven strategies working together, we will see the end to this tragedy. We will continue to see parents reunited with their loved ones, children given the right to grow up in safe and nurturing environment, and men and women restored to have hope for their future. 
Our team here at Hope for Justice are changing lives every day. Our advocates and social workers use the wealth of experience to guide our survivors along every step of their journey towards restoration. Our trainers and program staff spend time directly engaging with communities to make a real difference. Our partnerships and communications teams who constantly innovate and refine the way in which we engage and inform our wider society. Every single one of them working together to see a world free from modern day slavery and put human trafficking in the history books where it belongs. Thank you so much, Laura. As we saw in the video, um, it covers a bit about human trafficking and Tamika gave such an incredible overview um, of what the issue is. Uh, talking through it, I think it's when we hear the word slavery, many think that it's something in the past. We believe that it is some of the dark, darkest practices in uh, our history, um, and people don't think that it exists today. Uh, yet, as we've been talking, uh, many are, are so mistaken in that. Around the world, it's an estimated 50 million people are in some form of forced labor, sexual ex exploitation, or domestic servitude, and one in every four victims are children. It is estimated that modern slavery will generate 150 billion, that's a B as in billion, uh, dollars in illicit profits every year globally. Um, and if you break that down, that's over $5,000 a second. In the United States, there are an estimated 403, 403,000 people living in conditions of modern day slavery. One in six endangered runaways report to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children are likely to be sex trafficking victims. There was a 130% increase in online enticement reports in 2021 compared to 2019. Uh, that's a difference of 44,155 versus 19,174. In 2021, 10,359 situations of human trafficking were reported to the U.S. National Human Trafficking Hotline involving 16,554 individual victims. With a problem that is so vast and widespread, it is sometimes difficult to believe that there's anything that we could do, that is, is there even a solution, um, or how could we put an end to such evil, but uh, I'm here to share that there's hope. Tamika has shared that there is hope. Um, and the fact that you are sitting here uh, on a Wednesday evening listening to all of this um, is the first step in believing that we can actually uh, make a difference and put an end to this. Hope for Justice is an international nonprofit working on the front lines of the fight against human trafficking and modern slavery. We do more than just raise awareness. We intervene to help victims and assist law enforcement in bringing perpetrators to justice. And we do this through our four pillar model. The first pillar is preventing exploitation. One of the most impactful ways of ending modern day slavery is through prevention and community programs. Our outreach teams and self-help groups and community education initiatives equip and empower people to protect themselves and their families from predatory traffickers and their recruiters. Our second pillar is rescuing victims. Our specialist teams work closely with law enforcement to identify victims of trafficking and modern slavery, build bridges of trust with them and remove them from exploitation and into safety. Our investigators and trainers um, are recognized experts with the FBI and NCIS experience. They build cases to ensure perpetrators are brought to justice. Um, in 2019 and 2020 yearly report, Hope for Justice recorded that 1,208 vulnerable and exploited children were brought home to their moms and dads. It's an important number, uh, I think, to always share. Our third pillar is restoring lives. We help survivors overcome trauma and rebuild their lives. Our network of safe houses and shelters offers aftercare, and we help survivors every step of the journey towards recovery, freedom, and independence. More than 100,000 children have been reached by our programs globally across five continents in 30 plus locations. And the fourth and final pillar, and this is one that I've spoke with 
uh, many GFWC groups about um, is reform, and that's reforming society, um, becoming advocates to, to change laws and put better laws in place um, to help the victims rather than the perpetrators. Uh, reforming society to fight against those who wish to exploit others. We train professionals to stop the signs of trafficking and to respond and campaign for policy changes. Um, we help businesses protect their supply chains uh, through our sister organization called Slave Free Alliance, looking for uh, forced labor um, and just so many different programs like that. We have uh, worked with federal government, state governments to, to help put those laws in place, um, like I said, to, to help uh, the victims um, and, and be able to uh, help put an end to this. Um, with these four pillars, prevent, rescue, restore, and reform, we believe that we will see an end to modern slavery. Hope for Justice's vision is to live in a world free from slavery, and every step of the journey towards achieving this ambition is empowered by a global movement of supporters, campaigners, donors, and fundraisers, and what we like to call freedom bringers. Um, if you can see me, I am holding up, this is a lock, um, can't quite tell, but it is an unlocked padlock. And uh, we have a freedom wall in every one of our offices across the globe um, that have these all across it. And on each one has a name and a year on it. And that represents someone who has been rescued and is a survivor of human trafficking through Hope for Justice's services. And I read to you so many statistics at the beginning, um, but sometimes you need to bring it down and remember that each one of these is a life. It is a sister. It is a friend. It is a brother. You know, it's a daughter. And um, we dream about a legacy, a legacy of freedom, and a legacy that sees an end of human trafficking. And my ask is, will you join us for that fight um, today to end slavery and to change lives? And I am just so grateful that we're able to share this. I always like to say that this is the first step because you sat and you listened. Um, through a partnership with Tamika, we've talked a lot about better ways to support the clubs of spotting the signs, getting uh, resources to know what um, you can do about this. And uh, we've developed a training that we can uh, give to the clubs to, uh, to walk through a presentation. We have online modules. We talked a lot about online uh, violence earlier to this evening, and we have a training for um, what parents to look out for, for the online exploitation of children. And that is all free um, through our Learning Academy. So these are just a few of the things that we have going for you and um, just the resources to, to give to the clubs to be able to work through this. So that is what I have for you. Uh, Tamika, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, um, for sharing. Uh, to wrap up this section um, of the webinar, we move into the ask or the of human trafficking part of the webinar. We move into the ask or your work or our work. We take our knowledge and we turn it into action. How can we do that? So my first ask is that you educate yourself, continue to educate yourself and others. This can be accomplished in many ways. And Rachel just has shared some super exciting news that we've been working on and they were already working on as an organization as well. But honing it in for what we as GFWC Florida clubs need. And it's very specific training plan that has been designed and is ready for rollout almost, I think. So hopefully within the next couple of months, I will receive the training myself and we'll be able to launch a statewide training schedule um, either by district or individual clubs. My second ask is be aware of human trafficking awareness communications. So for those of you who have Facebook, please make sure that you are following GFWC Florida. Excuse me one moment. Please make sure that you are following the GFWC Florida Facebook page, uh, Florida members page, my apologies. When I see the events that are happening in our state related to human trafficking, 
I will ask that they get posted um, on that page so you will be able to see the things that you need to see. Also make sure that you are engaged in communications that may come from your district directors. Some of the districts have human trafficking uh, awareness liaisons or um, communication may come directly from me um, on human trafficking awareness. Sometimes there are time sensitive actions that need to be taken. Um, things like when it comes to reform, so changing law, right? Um, there are times when lawmaker campaigns are launched and we either need to garner support or we need to garner opposition for that legislation being proposed. Because not all legislation that has the title human trafficking aware, human trafficking, and it is necessarily good. We want to make sure that the victim doesn't become the criminal. Um, my third ask is remember reporting. That seems like a crazy ask in this type of how does that help with human trafficking? But here's how. Some clubs have spoken with me about some amazing things that you are doing or wish to do, such as getting the city, one club uh, got the city to show support in ending human trafficking with a proclamation. So please report those types of things so your club not only gets the credit for the work, but more importantly, to show others that it is possible. Sharing through reporting also provides clubs with ideas that they may not have thought of, but they are able to use in their communities. My fourth ask is that you help me. I need some folks to help make sure that our entire state has resources related to human trafficking awareness. I'm looking for a team to toss some ideas around that we may be able to implement statewide with the idea of having maximum impact. So we have the resources, but we need to know what's happening specific in your area for clarification. This is a huge problem, human trafficking, that requires a grand, intentional, strategic effort to eradicate. When the survey goes out, it will ask you if you are interested in being a part of this think tank. I hope you will join me in that conversation. And none of this, no, let me not say none of this, but a big part of showing um, support also, some people may say, I don't have time, I don't have the, I don't know what to do, um, but resources are needed as well. So what Hope for Justice does, it requires resources. So sometimes your way of helping may be helping them with those resources. So that is what I have. Thank you for being here. It is not by chance that Lee and I um, work together. As you've heard, many of the things that we talk about are very similar. Domestic violence and human trafficking can flow if, if not, um, I think it was Dana who said the cycle. So I will turn it over to Laura who will get us into our session. Thank you, Tamika and Rachel, that was terrific. Yes, I'm setting up breakout rooms. So for those of you who this is not familiar to you, we are going to go into five separate rooms. Um, our breakout room facilitators are going to be Lee Krause, Tamika Thomas Simpson, Kathleen Hudson, Beverly Payne, and Dana Rutherford. So if you would just sit tight for one moment, you're about to get an invitation on your screen from me inviting you to go into a breakout room. You just need to click yes or accept or something like that. Um, and let's see here. I have this just about set up. So why do I have Dana on here twice? Oh, I don't have Dana on here twice. Okay. Dana is, sorry guys, this just takes a little bit of maneuvering here. So bear with me for a second. Um, Deb, are there any questions in the chat box while I'm setting this up? Um, actually, everybody is just uh, astounded at the awesome presentations. And those are the types of comments you're getting and thanking the presenters for presenting on these important topics. But there's no questions so far. Okay, super. Well, I am just about ready here. So let me just review my list and make sure that I've got everybody in the right rooms. I'm going to have in room number one, your facilitator is going to be Kathleen Hudson. In room number two, your facilitator is going to be Bev Payne. 
In room three, your facilitator is going to be Tanika Thomas Simpson. In room four, your facilitator is going to be Lee Krause. And in room five, your facilitator is going to be Dana Rutherford. All right, ladies, I'm going to open the rooms. You're going to have 15 minutes. Some of you may have trouble turning your camera on. If you couldn't turn it off and I had to turn it off for you, you may not be able to turn it back on. Um, but hopefully that will all work out and you'll be able to do that. If not, you can just request that I come into your room and turn it on for you. Um, but turn on your cameras and your mics as soon as you get in there. We'll give you 15 minutes. I'll give you about a two-minute warning, and then we'll all come back together and see what we talked about. So here we go. Just click join when you see the message. Nika, why am I still seeing you? Did you not get a message? Oh, there we go. Okay. Deb, are you still here with me? Did yes, I am. to stop the recording. Okay, thank you, dear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm and stopping, what? not pausing, right? Yes. Um, or pause. Pause. Yes. Pause in this case, and that way we'll pick it back up again. Rosalind, are you in your breakout room? I know that I know the time always flies in those breakout rooms, but we're glad that you're back, and we're going to ask each facilitator to spend a minute or two um, sharing just very briefly what you talked about. I know you can't cover it all. Um, Lee, let's start with you, please. Okay. So if, uh, most of the women definitely considered that they had teen dating violence in their community as well as human trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, we had Satellite Beach, North Pinellas, Clearwater. They've also, when we asked what facilities that they partnered with or worked with, and wonderful, uh, there's a uh, North Pinellas is Sela Freedom that they work with. Um, Clearwater is Sanctuary House. And I think that there is um, Salt of Life, I'm sorry, Life Recaptured was one that sounded very, very interesting. We are on the subject of, um, telephone usage for teenagers and the fact of Snapchat being such a terrible app for them to be on. Terrible. And TikTok. Both of those apps are ones that as parents and grandparents, we should do everything we can to not have them be on those apps. So that was prevalent at first and foremost, I think. But thank it was, me. yeah, thank you. Excellent. Uh, Kathleen. I don't know if we have everybody back. It seems like we're missing a lot of people, but I really don't know where they are. So it says they're not in their rooms anymore. Tamika's there. Find off. All right, well, let's go to you, Tamika. We'll try to find Kathleen. Kathleen is there. She is. Okay, Tamika, you're up, and then we'll come back to Kathleen. Okay. Um, we did find that in our chat, it was a good discussion, like Lee said as well, um, that everyone believed that they did have um, teen, uh, teen dating violence and human trafficking. Um, some of them are discussed in their communities more than, uh, more than others is what we found. Um, depending on where you are in the state, you hear conversations and there are resources available. Whereas you may go to another part of the state and the convert, you know, it happens. Um, but there's not really any resources for it. Um, and so the clubs have decided to um, support where they can. Um, another thing is that with the partnerships, um, I think everyone that was in our group uh, had some type of uh, partnership that they were involved in. I will say more so on the human trafficking side than the teen dating violence side. I didn't really hear that for that. Um, there's a lot of amazing things that are going on in each of the clubs that they shared um, what they're doing, like book studies and books and trainings and all the things. So um, hopefully we'll have another time to share all of that out. I know we have time limits, but it thank was a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen. I'm sorry. I forgot to unmute. Um, <laughs> yes to both of the first two questions. And a couple of reasons, 
statistics say yes, it's there. Um, and there's not enough attention given to uh, teen dating violence and human trafficking. And with human trafficking, the migrant workers in our area were mentioned. And a lot of the migrant kids are not allowed to go to school because they have to work during the day. Um, a domestic violence shelter that a club had partnered with is called CARE, Crisis Against Rape. And I can't experience, I, I don't remember what the E was. And then also something that I had just seen recently on Facebook is April 26th is Denim Day. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Thank you, Kathleen. Excellent. Bev. Okay. Um, pre, my my uh, group pretty much agreed with everybody that they know that teen violence exists, human trafficking exists. Depending on where you are in Florida, it's more obvious than other places. Uh, like Miami, you go to, like Jenna was saying, in Miami, you go there, there's signs all over the malls, look, you have signals to look for. Uh, other places have it. Pinellas has done, which you know, Laura, the club has done a lot of things. Um, all the clubs seem to be involved in some aspect of a domestic violence organization, again, depending on where they are. But uh, But I think everyone is aware that it exists some have more specific ideas as to how it exists. Others just like, I know it exists because I hear that it exists, but I see no signs of it. So again, it but um, all the ladies agree it exists and it's something that we need to all be aware of. Thank you, Bev. And Dana, your art, there you go. Okay, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, yes, they, our group all saw it. There is that in our communities. Many of us were in the Tampa area, so that is a huge hot spot for um, human trafficking, but all areas are always a hot spot too for domestic violence. It happens everywhere. So um, we also talked about the fact that they can coexist where you will have an intersection between the both of you know, the person that might be being trafficked is being trafficked by their intimate partner. So that could mean that um, they are experiencing both domestic violence and human trafficking. Um, many of the clubs are participating with even uh, somebody had said that they were even had somebody come from Hope for Justice. So um, they were able to, they already recognized, you know, that that name and that club or that organization and um, also Pasco County and Sunrise of Pasco and um, talked about the fact that they wanted to do more of that and also that um, a way to look for that is to try to be there for the victim and not blame the victim, whether it be either human trafficking or domestic violence or teen dating violence. Thanks, Dana. All right, ladies, a short wrap up here. I hope you have enjoyed tonight's presentation. Of course, Laura, a special thank Laura, you. Yes. Can I just add one thing. Yes. On April 26th, it is denim awareness. That's the day that we wear denim to, to talk about sexual assault awareness. So that's the only thing I wanted to add. Thank, Thank you. you. So special thanks to Lee and Tamika and Dana and Rachel. You all gave amazing insightful, personal presentations that I know touched all of us. So thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, a couple of notes. Carolyn has just put a link in the chat box. Please open your chat box, move your mouse around, find your chat box, click on that link. We really want to know your thoughts, not just on tonight, of course, but remember this is your opportunity to weigh in on additional topics you want to see before we um, before we create next year's calendar. The Laura, next webinar, yes. Can I interrupt before? So Tamika mentioned earlier the ask, and she is putting together a GFWC Florida task force to work on the items we discussed tonight. If you're willing to assist her in the survey, that is one of the questions and um, click yes. And we will take your contact information and get that to her. Thank so you, that Carolyn. is part of the survey. Um, I will send it out in the next couple of days, along with the recording video. If for some reason you do not get that completed tonight. Thank you, Carolyn. Appreciate you.
Appreciate all the behind the scenes support from that committee. Um, mark your calendars, Wednesday, May 3rd at seven o'clock Eastern is the last one of this season, the last webinar. It is grant writing with Metris Bats. She's always not only super entertaining, but super knowledgeable on this topic. So you definitely don't wanna miss that. If you live in districts eight, 12, 13, or five, the district membership workshop is coming to you. You should, your district director has those dates. Your club president has that those dates. You can sign up in the member center. It's been getting great reviews all over the state and you definitely want to be a part of it. Um, Carolyn mentioned the follow-up email. So be sure and um, share that link with anybody in your club that may want to watch the recording of tonight. Unless anybody else has anything in the way of follow-up, I just want to say thank you for being here. Anybody else have anything? How do we get to the survey? I saw it pop up at one time and now it's gone away. It's in the chat box. So move your mouse around until you see the chat box and click on it. If you're on a laptop, it's probably down at the bottom. If you're on a cell phone, it might be somewhere else. You might have to click on more. There might be like three little dots if there's not enough show space to show box. it. Hold yeah, and it says chat. And you click on that. I'll leave the link up for a little bit longer so you can find it. It's also coming out in the in the email from Carolyn in the next couple of days. Okay. You can do it that way. Okay. Who is asking for the link? I can email it to you. Is I'd like good? the link. <laughs> okay. I'll email it to you, Lee. And I, I, just I have to it. Say, thank you, you for um, engaging in this conversation that is very difficult to have and very difficult to listen to. But there is hope. We can see it in Dana. And so we there is hope and we can hear about it from Rachel. So thank you both. Like well, Thanks, so I just have to say, because I just it, it's very touching. So thank you. It was amazing. Very tonight, good ladies. workshop, y'all. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Bye, everybody. Hope to see you all at convention real soon. Yes. Coming yeah. up soon. <laughs> Good night, ladies. Thank Good night, you. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Deb. I'll leave this up <laughs> for another minute or so in case somebody's trying to get the link out of the chat box. Yeah. So, Laura, I noticed how fast they, they signed off either right at the break or before the break. There were only five rooms. So, um, with 50 people, that would have been 10 per room. So, that didn't happen in our session. You're right. Mm -mm.